Holy cow, we're almost there. Tomorrow and Thursday, taking that midterm. Uh, I'm going to go over some details of that here in a moment. Uh, quick plug for that wonderful Quizlet made by Alyssa. How nice of her. Um, I sent you guys an email yesterday. You have the link. If you want, you just have to make a free account on Quizlet. A lot of you guys probably already have one. But look how pretty this is. Look at that. Oh, my gosh. What are heterogeneous mixtures? Make sure they're not uniform throughout. Look at that. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, so if you want to use that, feel free. You don't have to. I'll never know. Other way. But want to put in a plug. All right, now let's talk about that midterm tomorrow. Let's talk about that midterm. Grand total between the two days. Between the two days. So Wednesday plus Thursday, we're looking at 13 total questions. Okay? 13 total questions between those two. Um, I think it's six the first day and seven the second day. But um, some of the questions on the second day are a little bit shorter. If that kind of makes sense. So time-wise, it should be pretty even how much time it takes you. Uh, either day. Um, it is 20% of your semester one grade. So it is an actual midterm. Um, that means that that 5% that a lot of you guys are going to get for that packet, that is a nice chunk of your overall semester grade. So that's kind of nice. Um, but that's also very normal. The midterms are always 20% of the semester grade. So... Um, there's that. Um, let me see here. On day one, you'll be given a MSDS, and that's all you need. You will not need a periodic table at all on day one, so I will not provide you with one. Okay, because you don't need it. It won't be any advantage or disadvantage to have the periodic table. Um, so you'll just have an MSDS. Remember section nine. Okay, most important part of an MSDS. Um, there will be. Uh, only one question that requires that MSDS, but you'll you'll need it very badly for that question. Um, the MSDS will be the back page. You can pull it off when you start your test if you'd like to, so you can kind of have it uh, adjacent to your test itself. A lot of people like that. Uh, the periodic table will be on day two only. The reason we did this was because a lot of you guys, um, you like to write a lot on your periodic table, and you take like the first three or four minutes to kind of write all over that when you start a test, which is totally fine with me. Like I really encourage that kind of thing. And I didn't want to make you go through that whole process twice, where you have to like label it and write all out and spend a lot of time labeling your periodic table both days. So um, we are only having you um, do that on the second day. So any question that will require you to use a periodic table, thank you so much. So that could be stuff like uh, protons, neutrons, electrons. You can't do that without the periodic table. Um, names of compounds or formulas. Can't do that without the periodic table. So all those you know for a fact will be on day two. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. The periodic table will be the last page. Again, you can pull it off just like normal. Again, uh, I'm leaving the back page of the periodic table blank should you want for uh, like scrap sheet, that kind of thing. Um, and then you'll turn it in right next to your test just like you have the last couple of unit tests. Does that make sense? There's that. Um, now, uh, today we're going to kind of talk about some general tips, um, things that are good for you. Uh, towards the end of the period, I'll just kind of go through a few things as I hold up an actual copy of the exam, just sort of thinking out loud and give you guys a few tips. Now, what I want to do today is, for any of you guys who has a star next to a semester review packet problem, we're going to talk about those. After we kind of go through that, um, and some key ones I think are good for you guys to be able to do. Uh, I will then um, have people start coming up here, and I can check your packets for you, get your 5%, uh, and you will also have access to answer keys, um, that kind of thing. So are there any problems that you guys would like to go over right now as a class, as a class? Jameson. <laughs> a pencil. Somebody help this man out. Uh, I'm sure someone's got one for you. What we got here? There's one back there. Yes, Izzy, what you got? 37. You got it, Izzy. Boom. Okay. Great. Draw and label a heating curve and cooling curve for water between... Okay. I'm actually so glad you asked me about this one. That's great. Okay. I will do the heating curve. I'll let you guys kind of figure out the cooling curve. Okay. So heating curve means our temperature, generally speaking, is going to go up. So um, here's, the, here's the shape, and you'll probably recall this here in a moment. Up. Flat, up, flat, up. Sound kind of familiar? If we're dealing with water, we know that this first flat part where we have a phase change between solid and liquid, uh, what temperature should that be? Zero degrees Celsius. Now I'll kind of label this uh, degrees Celsius right here. 
Uh, the second flat part would be what? 100, okay. And that's where your boiling or condensing is happening. Um, now, you'd want to include other specific kind of labels here, like, hey, this is where your melting is happening. Um, since this is a heating curve, you're going this way on it. So you're going from the solid to the liquid, that would be melting. If this were the other curve, you'd say that's where freezing is going down, okay? Uh, so there's more labeling to be done there. I'll let you guys kind of figure the rest of that out. Um, one reason that's great that you asked me about this, this right here, problem number 38, this is one of the most missed ones where I'm checking people's packets. Now, if you have the whole packet filled out and this is one of the only issues, you're still going to get your 5%. But a thing I've been giving a lot of people feedback on is number 38. Because they'll have kind of like, a lot of times they'll have sort of like the same thing right here. Okay, that is not what we're looking for there for endothermic or exothermic processes. Um, you need to maybe consult your unit 3 notes. That is when we have endothermic and exothermic. So it should kind of have like that more hill type shape. Okay, and you want to have your reactants and products labeled. So you guys should figure those ones out um, on your own. Um, but I will give you feedback there if you're a little bit off on those. Uh, other questions people have? Other questions? Yeah, Tracy. 32. Oh, yeah, 5Q. Let's do this. Let's do the whole problem. Because uh, I know other folks had questions, too. All righty. So uh, this is just for honors only. So if you're a regular student watching at home, regular chem, uh, you do not need to worry about this problem. You can skip this part of the video. Uh, so, the thing that I like to do is I like to draw that heating cooling curve to sort of help myself out. Um, so, boom, boom. Uh, we are going from hot to cold. Okay? So, I'm going to start at a higher temperature. So, boom, flat, boom, flat, boom. There we go. Trying to draw this out a little bit. Um, and you don't have to draw this, but I find it helpful personally. And I know that over here, this top temperature will be what again? 100 because it's water. What about this guy down here? Zero. Alrighty. Now on this one, I know I'm starting somewhere above 100, so let's just say it's like right here. Why not? Uh, and I know I'm ending somewhere below zero at negative 25. So how many Q's do I need? I need one, two, three, four, five. You will not always have to calculate five Q's. Maybe it's only three Qs, two Qs, four Qs, um, but five is the max. Okay, so you want to go through this so you know exactly how many you need for any particular problem. Okay, um, now I'm going to come over here. I'm just going to write, since I need five Qs, I'm going to make myself a little bit of space here. Clear that out a bit. There we go. I'm just going to go ahead and write all my Qs. Q1 equals Q2 equals Q3 equals... Q4, Q5. Okay? Now I know I have to calculate all those, so I'm going to go ahead and just set it up. All right. For this first part, we're going from here to here only. Okay? Um, is there a change in temperature? Yes, there is. Okay? So it's going to be Q equals MC delta T. My M is going to be 300. There's that. It's going to be 300 here. I see. What is my heat capacity all the way up here? What's it going to be? 2.02. How do you know that? It's a gas, right? If it's water above 100 degrees, we're talking about a gas. Um, by the way, this right here provided to you on your test. You do not have to memorize anything inside that red bubble. Uh, but yes, it's 2.02 because we were dealing with a gas up there. Um, and then what is our change in temperature for this section? 20. Just 20. You're going from 120 down to 100. And remember, we're always keeping our delta T positive. Okay, we just want the absolute value there. We'll calculate that here in a second. Uh, Q2, we always start with mass, 300. Is there a delta T for our Q2, though, when we go across this bridge right here? Okay. No, there's not. So this is not a Q equals MC delta T. This is just a Q equals MH. Um, is that the cheap bridge or the expensive bridge? It is the expensive one. It's up top, so that's our vaporization bridge, the 2260L price. That's coming from right here. And we'll calculate that here in a minute. All right, Q3, we're going from here to here. This is our third section. Um, is there a delta T? 
Yes, there is. So this is going to be an MC delta T situation. We got 300. What is our C value now? 4.18, because we're talking about liquid water at this point. It's in between 100 and 0, 4.18. Uh, and how much is the temperature changing in this particular section? 100 degrees. We're going from 100 down to 0. Q4, 300 times something. They're all 300 times something. Uh, is there a delta T here? No, there is not. So it's a QM delta H situation. Cheap or expensive bridge? Cheap, so it's just a 334. Heat diffusion from up top. And lastly, we're going from here and we're going to cool that ice down. Um, so that is going to be your 300 grams times your 2.06 now because we're dealing with solid H2O times the delta T of 25 because we went from 0 down to negative 25. So we need to calculate all these guys. I'm going to give myself a little bit of space here. If I go ahead and punch these numbers in. So let me see here. I got 300 times 2.02 times 20. So I'm getting 1, 2, 1, 2, 0 oh for that puppy. And then I got 300 times my 226 out. I'm getting 6, 7. This is going to be a huge number for that. 300 times 4.18. Times 100. There are so many places that make a mistake here because you're just punching in a lot of numbers. So if you're super, super organized, that is definitely the most important key to victory is being very organized. This guy comes out to be, there we go. And that last one, 300 times 2.06 times 25. 1.5. Four, five, oh, what do I need to do with all these? I got to add all these up. Okay. Uh, and that will get me a final answer. Uh, let me see here. I think it's uh, 930 something thousand. Let me see. Oh, yes. 931,170. What? Joules, right, because it's a Q. And of course, you would never dream of not boxing it up as the model student. Because you're like, hey, Mr. Poster, grade right that right there. So glad we asked about this one. Got clarity now. Love it. Feel good? Okay. Other questions that people have. Other questions that people have. Hudson. 33. Oh, we just love this page, huh? Uh, all right, let me see here. I'm going to get all this out of the way. Boom, look at all that beautiful work. It's all gone. Explain how light is released, though. Yeah, all right. So how is light released? So this is the one where um, where we get light. It's all about the electrons moving. Um, I will kind of start this one off. Where do electrons always start? It's a... Okay, so your electrons are in... I'm going to be pretty brief here. You should probably give it a little bit more detail. Ground state... Oh, I love it. That's low energy, close to nucleus. Remember, you can't just drop the magical term ground state. you got to make it clear to me that you know what that means. So then you add some energy. And this is when you are um, you're striking uh, the substance. You are putting it into a flame. You're flipping a light switch. You're adding energy somehow to whatever the substance you're working with is. Uh, and then after that, I'll let you guys kind of figure that out on your own, going back to your old notes, you're talking with a partner, that kind of thing. But that's the beginning steps. Uh, hopefully that sounds kind of familiar to you. Does that sound kind of ringing a bell a little bit for you there, Hudson? That's from Unit 4, by the way. Uh, other questions? Any other start problems for now? All good. Okay. Um, quick notes. So if I scroll down here, these two problems right here, 42 and 43, towards the end of your packet. Now, yours will look a little bit different from my answer key because um, my answer key, usually we get a little bit further in unit six by the end of the semester. So my questions 42 and 43 on my answer key, they have a little bit um, different, they have a few different problems. 
Some of them are the same, some are a little bit different. Um, but that's why, it's because we usually get a little bit further into Unit 6. Uh, the ones in my answer key that are not on your packet, you are totally not responsible for. Okay? So don't worry about those. Um, but I didn't want to have to print, um, you know, another tree's worth of answer keys. So I just figured I'd point that out to you here. Um, but if you have any questions about these, please let me know. Um, alrighty. So you guys are free to work for a little while here. Um, I will probably give some notes here um, towards the end of the class period. So um, I'll hit pause for now for you guys at home. All right, so let's talk about number 41 here from yesterday. Um, so this is where I had some salt and some chlorine gas in the same beaker. And we know that salt or chlorine and, um, or sodium and chlorine, I should say sodium and chlorine were in the same beaker. They, they love each other, match made in heaven. Sodium just wants to get rid of an electron. Chlorine definitely wants to gain an electron. So that's like perfect business partnership there. Um, but when I put them into the beaker, nothing happened until I put a little drop of water to land on the sodium, and then all of a sudden they freaked out. They had a, flames were all over the place, and then they made salts, a little NaCl, also known as sodium chloride. Okay, so let's talk about what happened here. Well, right here, this is where the reaction took place. The sodium was sitting right here on this piece of glass, and as you can see, this glass is really messed up. It was nice and clear and see-through. But now it's all goofed up. You kind of see how this? It got so hot that it melted and cracked the glass. Okay? That's really extreme. Really, really extremely hot. Um, so, this first question was it endothermic or exothermic? So remember, endo and exothermic are from the perspective of the system. You may remember me emphasizing that a lot in Unit 3 the system. The system is a reference to your chemicals, so just the sodium and chlorine. So if the surrounding glass got super duper hot, was energy exiting your system or entering your system? It was exiting, right? It was leaving your system and going into its surroundings. That's why the glass got really hot. So exothermic, and you'd want to have some explanation of leaving the system, of exiting the system, entering the surroundings, something like that, okay, to explain yourself, because you're always going to have to explain on these. Uh, now what about the entropy? Well, entropy, remember, has to do with phases. So you actually just need to go up to this equation right here. You have a solid and a gas starting off, and they made a solid at the end. So maybe you recall our ranking system. You don't have to recall a ranking system. There's a few ways to do this. But sodium or salt is like a 2 on that ranking system. Gas is like a 35. And then they make a 2. So we went from a 37 down to a 2. That's a huge decrease. Honestly, lots of times you can just kind of look at um, where the gas is, okay? The gas is always going to be like the trump factor for the most part because it has way higher entropy than everything else. Um, but we had a gas and then we don't, so that's going to be a big decrease in entropy for sure. Again, you want to explain yourself briefly, mention the phases that we're in. Now, was this reaction spontaneous? Did it happen on its own without my continued help? Yes, it did. I did have to sort of start it. I had to kind of push it over the hill. Um, but even if I have to start it, as long as I don't have to keep helping it, it's spontaneous. It means it happens naturally. Okay? So, yes, it is spontaneous. Now, what are the two factors? So, what are the two things that nature loves to spread ever since the Big Bang? What are the two things it loves to spread? Disorder, a.k.a. entropy. So, it likes to spread entropy. And what's the other thing? Heat or also known as being exothermic. So nature loves exothermic reactions and it loves ones that increase entropy. So nature loves the fact that it's um, exothermic, but it does not like the fact that it's a decrease in entropy. But this reaction still ha happens spontaneously, so we need to think about why that is. Well, it must be because of the exothermic nature, because the decrease in entropy is not helping it happen naturally. Um, so, was spontaneous? Yes. Explain. Are the two contributing factors working together? Uh, no. Um, uh, exothermic helps spontaneity, but decreased entropy. I'm, gonna, I'm running out of space here. It does not. There we go. So this person made it clear to their teacher, Mr. Pilcher, that they know that um, exo or endo and entropy are the two factors. 
and they explain how they were working together and how they were not working together. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So uh, you want to just be very clear on that, that those two things you know, hey, I know that the universe loves to spread entropy and um, heat, aka being exothermic, and these are not working together in this particular case. Um, are there any other questions this last minute or two of class? Do all right? Well, in terms of tips for your test, don't forget about your MSDSs. We got some, got a couple thinkers. So tomorrow's version only has six questions. Uh, day two has seven questions. Although the questions on day two are on average a little bit shorter than day one. So even though it has more questions, it should take you the same amount of time, roughly speaking. Um, MSDS stuff will be tomorrow. We also got some lots of calculations, density calculations, Q equals MCT, delta, MC delta T stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Physical chemical changes, properties, intensive, extensive. And remember, day two is the one that has all the periodic table stuff. So anything that has to do with naming, number of protons, neutrons, electrons, charge, mass, um, anything about trends, okay? So like how reactive are these guys, how small or big are these guys, that all requires a periodic table, so you will have all that on the second day. Does that make sense? Alrighty, great stuff today. Um, please let me know if you have any questions at all. You can email me or come see me uh, later during the day today.